Hello and welcome to Open Science. I'm Dr. Marshall Porterfield, and today we will be discussing the impact of sex and gender on adaptation to space. Joining me today in this discussion, a uh, distinguished panel, Dr. Graham Scott to my left from the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, NASA's Senior Medical Advisor, Dr. Sarah Lynn Mark, and from the Human Exploration and Mission Operations Directorate, Dr. Betty Segal. Now that together as a team, you've been working with other investigators to study and under better understand the role of impact of sex and gender in spaceflight adaptation. So what are some of the key findings from your studies? Just off the top. Firstly, Marshall, let me say that both women and men do very well in space. Uh, having said that, we do see some differences. Some of these are very subtle and others are more pronounced. For example, um, the majority of our astronauts are now having some um, visual impairment issues. Most, in most cases, these are mild, really just involving um, a change in the prescription uh, that an astronaut might need in, in her or his eyeglasses, you know, one to two months, let's say, into the mission. But in a minority of cases, maybe in about 20% of the cases, we're seeing more significant issues with the eyes. And um, these can involve changes in actually the shape of the eyes that don't even fully resolve when the astronauts return to Earth. And we're seeing these more pathological changes. We're seeing those only in the male astronauts. The other area where there are some quite significant differences in, is in the ability of our male and our female astronauts to spend time in space. And this is due to the radiation uh, limits that NASA imposes on the astronauts. So our female astronauts can spend significantly fewer days in space because based on ground studies and based on data that's been collected over several decades, um, it's been uh, prognosticated that the female astronauts are more susceptible to, to cancer. And NASA has set a very strict limit of uh, only having a 3% increased risk of cancer due to time and space uh, over the course of an astronaut's lifetime. So that, that's a couple of examples of where we do see some significant differences in how our male and our female astronauts are adapted to spaceflight. We also see interesting findings in the cardiovascular realm. Mm -hmm. Generally, women who respond to stress with an increase of heart rate Men tend to respond by clamping down their vessels, primarily due to hormones such as testosterone that causes that vasoconstriction, that closing down of the blood vessel to maintain blood pressure. We see with many of our women, female astronauts returning that they may experience what we call orthostatic hypotension. And what that means is a drop in blood pressure which puts them at risk for fainting. And it's primarily due, we believe, to these changes in volume as well as how we respond to stress. Men and women respond differently in their vasculature. What we did is we looked at things that we see here on Earth and tried to see if we would see them in space. So we know on Earth we usually see women, especially as they get older, developing osteoporosis, their bones lose calcium. But when we looked at the data to see what we would see in space, we actually didn't see a gender effect. We didn't see a difference between the male and female. It was all over the place, basically. Yeah, and, and, and what Betty's alluding to is that there are a lot of personal differences. So mm -hmm. we're now living in this era of precision medicine and what we see is that there, there are very individualized responses to the spaceflight environment. To, to, um, to add on to what Betty's saying, some people actually come back with increased muscle mass relative to the muscle mass that they had when they left uh, to go up uh, onto the International Space Station for six months. And others come back with somewhat less muscle mass or bone mass. So there are real uh, opportunities to, to, um, to tailor countermeasures to each astronaut and really invoke this whole new uh, approach of personalized medicine to um, really make everyone's uh, stay in space as healthy and as productive as possible. What we saw, and we had six work groups looking at how the human body adapts to space. So those work groups included cardiovascular, neurosensory, reproductive, immunological, behavioral, and certainly reproductive has been traditionally what we viewed, but we went even well beyond that. And then, of course, muscular skeletal. And we found differences throughout the body. Now, the question is, is it statistically significant? That may not be as much an issue in regard to how does that translate to what we see clinically. 
I think what's exciting is as we're increasing our numbers of women flying, we'll have a better database, we'll be able to assess. But we have to keep in mind, we're not looking at who's faster, who's better, who's mm -hmm. smarter, who's better able to adapt. What we're doing is trying to understand what we're seeing so that we can develop the appropriate countermeasures, develop the appropriate equipment so that we can keep both men and women healthy in space and when they return to Earth. And, and that's really a very important point because for our future exploration mi missions are going to be men and women. And so we need to make sure, we need to study it so that we know that the countermeasures to these changes that we see in space are going to both protect men and women, both while they're in space and when they return to Earth. Very good. It's a really fascinating area. And I noticed, though, um, in the title of your primary publication that recently came out, you made the distinction of sex and gender, using that term. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you explain to the audience why that's important to make that decision? So the Institute of Medicine has defined sex as your biology. Are you male or are you female? And gender is the way you um, respond in society. What we're really looking at is perhaps because you might be a female, maybe you're not getting the same medical care that you might get if you were male. And so, for example, on Earth, when people have a heart attack, we know these symptoms. You might have crushing pain in your chest and shooting down your arms. But that's really what men experience. Women very often experience fatigue, or they may experience feeling um, upset stomach, nauseous, or something. And so when they go to the doctor, someone may not check them out that see if they're having a heart attack. So in our papers, that's how we use the word gender. And actually, after a while, the, de the definition started to blend together more. And I just want to follow up on that. When the Institute of Medicine released the report in 2001 entitled Does Sex Matter? Looking at the Biological Contributions to Health, they were very clear in how they defined sex and gender. Again, the psychosocial construct implying gender, the biological chromosomal implying sex. As we've evolved into the world of precision medicine, as we've evolved into a world where we understand the influence of genetics or human genome on our health, we've come into a space that we call epigenetics. And that certainly influences how we live our lives. So in a sense, as Betty has alluded to, the definition, the delineation between sex and gender has become more of a continuum. But we felt for the nature of this paper, we wanted to be a little more clear cut, acknowledging that the environment influences the genome and the genome influences the environment. Very good. So the data, the body of data that you use for your study included both ground-based and space flight-based research. How does your study benefit us back on Earth in terms of our medical technologies? I think space is a fantastic platform to study how the body adapts. I'm a, a geriatrician endocrinologist, so I see it as a model for, in a sense, accelerated aging. The body adapts to space, and it adapts in a way that is appropriate. The question is, can the body readapt back to Earth, and can we reverse some of the findings so that we can keep people healthy in space, and certainly when they return to Earth? I think what we have seen is that, as we've just alluded to, that there are changes in every system of the body. So, for example, we mentioned osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a state of low bone mineral density as well as what we call microarchitectural deterioration, meaning that the structure of the bone can be impaired, and that puts you at risk for developing fractures. On Earth, 80% of those afflicted tend to be women, and they're at higher risk, certainly, for developing fractures, and men tend to develop osteoporosis and fractures later on in life. So as we study how the body adapts, how bones adapt, how muscles adapt to space, we can learn appropriately how to prevent bone loss, and how to mitigate against that. And we can take those lessons and apply what we need to keep people healthy on Earth. We see it really in every system of the body. One of my other particular interesting favorites to study is how the body adapts from an immunological perspective. Uh, we know on Earth, women are more resistant to infection. But when they do get infected, they mount very robust responses. When women are pregnant, they lose that resistance, of course, so that they don't reject their fetus. In space, we know we have changes in the immune system. There's an altered immune expression to microbes, to bacteria, to really everything that you're experiencing in your environment. And we want to see, are we going to find those same findings on, in space as we do on Earth? And if so, how can we change that so people can stay healthy in space? Again, every system of the body changes, and it has significant relevance to how we age and stay healthy here on this planet. I think space medicine can also be translated to Earth in a couple of other contexts. So one is one is in the radiation area. So increasingly now, the leading 
uh, cancer hospitals are using particle therapy, proton therapy, and in, proton therapy, and in some parts of the world using carbon ions. And these are the types of particles actually that are uh, that are impacting our astronauts that are um, potentially causing damage in, in, in their cells and to their chromosomes. And so by studying the effect of space radiation uh, on our astronauts, we may actually also in parallel gain some insights to the effect of the, this particle therapy that is now um, being therapeutically uh, applied to, to patients here on Earth. The other, the other thing that I think is interesting is that space, sp the space environment is the ultimate stressful environment in terms of the human body. The human body has not evolved to necessarily to live in space, but yet we can live there very, very nicely. Um, so given that the, this is a stressful environment, I think that the, the way the body um, adjusts both at a molecular level and also at a physiological level can actually give us some really deep insights into how, uh, how much stress we can actually endure as a species and, and what actually happens as we go through those stressful situations, again, in terms of our molecular responses and our physiological responses. So just so that we have a better idea of the scope of the work that you've accomplished in this study, over what time period um, did, was the data that you um, used collected and what are we talking about in terms of population of subjects, astronauts? So we looked at the data from 1998 to about 2013 because that's when we finished our study. But actually there were studies and reports done that were even prior to 1998. So we were looking at the shuttle astronauts and the astronauts that were on space station. This included the U.S. astronauts as well as the astronauts of the partners. And at that time, during that time period, when you looked at the total number of astronauts, women were about 20% of the astronaut core. The um, good thing is we're moving in the right direction as the last astronaut selection was eight astronauts, four men and four women. And the reason that's important to us is, as a scientist, I want to see things that are statistically significant. And in order to do that, you have to increase the N. And so if we fly more women, we can study more women. And then we can make sure that the countermeasures we're developing will protect their health and the men's health as well. And I think what makes this program, what we developed, this study, exciting is that it was a collaborative effort. We had six work groups. We had over 50 scientists working across the country. Not only did we develop the manuscripts, but we also had a virtual workshop so that we could share our information with the general public. And it was a very much a collaborative effort and hopefully an ongoing effort, as Betty has alluded to. We are every day gathering new data, both from our academic partners and certainly within NASA and our other agencies that we work with, so that we can better ascertain sex and gender differences. So again, that we can develop the appropriate products and policies and programs to take care of our astronauts on Earth and when they return to space. Obviously, this is an important um, new study. Uh, it has importance and significance in terms of how we plan and operate the human research program in the future. How have you been working with the human research program in conducting this study and what are your recommendations? Yeah, so the human research program has taken a really strong interest in this study. And as Dr. Mark just mentioned, a number of the investigators that were authors on the various papers that were published, they're actually funded in many cases by the human research program. So there are a lot of touch points um, a number of the aspects, in fact, the majority of the aspects that were looked at in terms of musculoskeletal health or cardiovascular health, these impinge directly on some of the major risks that the human research program is seeking to mitigate, to close technology and uh, gaps and uh, to develop countermeasures for. Um, so I mentioned earlier in the conversation this, this visual impairment issue. This is this is the number one risk to human health in low Earth orbit. Um, and so the human research program is keenly interested in better understanding uh, this visual impairment issue, how it affects women, how it affects men, why there appear to be some differences. That could actually really give us a clue uh, to what's going on at a molecular or at a physiological level. Why, why are no women currently having these more clinically significant symptoms. That, that could actually be a big clue in terms of solving, uh, solving the underlying 
uh, mechanism of what's what's causing this visual impairment and then ultimately leading to a countermeasure. So absolutely the human research program and the organization that I work for, the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, we were very much involved in, in architecting and participating in the study and now the, the, the flow on effect is that there's uh, an increasing impetus to involve um, roughly equal numbers of males and females in, in uh, human research program and NSBRI funded s studies. Now it isn't possible in every single case, but there's a real um, gr you know, a groundswell, if you, if you will, um, and this is being, you know, this is being uh, seen in, in solicitation documents as well, to really try to get, uh, as, as Dr. Siegel said, um, enough female and enough male subjects that, can, that you can really start to look for these trends and then ultimately the goal is to build countermeasures for our females and for our male astronauts and also to develop these again, going back to what I said earlier on, for, on a personalised basis and an individualised basis. So we had, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, we had six teams basically and I just wanted to say and each team had a chair and a co-chair and the chair usually was a NASA expert, meaning they were either NASA or NSBRI, so they were people from HRP, and then the co-chair would be someone who had expertise in sex and gender research. And then the team members were about six to ten people, and they were, again, divided up like that. Okay. I just want to follow up when we talk about how do we assess the data. Traditionally, we have used statistical significance as being the ultimate goal, the gold standard. Mm -hmm. What we have learned from the National Institutes of Health, who've implemented a policy since 1993 through their NIH Revitalization Act, that they needed to include male and female subjects in their studies unless there's a particular reason why they should not be, that you don't actually need statistical significance to determine value. They've moved into a space that we call valid analysis. Uh, Dr. Scott has mentioned trends, and we can learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. I think it helps our researchers to know that they don't have to have exorbitant numbers, it doesn't have to be financially draining, but they do have to have sufficient numbers so that we can do the valid analysis. We're also moving into a time where we're looking at preclinical, so meaning we can study what happens in the cell culture, as well as animal studies to give us insight. We look at ground-based studies, what happens here on Earth. We also have flight-based studies. We work with animals. We work, of course, with humans. And I think when you look at the compendium of data from both those environments and all the various study subjects, you can make a best assessment of how the human body and the animal body adapts and what we need to do to keep people healthy. Very good. So, as we're all aware, the agency has a goal of performing a human mission to Mars at some point. What are your recommendations from your study with regards to a Mars architecture for ex human exploration? We had five robust recommendations, and if you were to drill down, the bottom line is we need to include more women and more men to fly and to conduct experiments both on Earth and in space, and that sex and gender is incorporated into all our experiences, experiments and what we do. And that will certainly influence, again, the policies that we develop, the products that we need to have so people can live in space, the educational programs that we need to provide to our astronauts and to the people that work with them to ensure that everyone has the best opportunity to live and work safely and with quality in space and on Earth. I want to take the opportunity to thank you all for joining me today. This is really a fascinating topic and it's very important to the agency and to uh, the future goals of the agency. So thank you very much for your hard work and good day. <laughs>